Okay. It's going to play a little right. One minute. Are you streaming the webcams as well to LinkedIn or is it just a presentation? It's everything. Okay. Yeah. So it's really a great tool because it also then saves it onto YouTube. So I don't have to do any editing. I don't have to do any of those things. Um, so I will start the meeting now. Uh, welcome team that are locally with me on um, Zoom. So we are live streaming for those who are on um, LinkedIn. I cannot see immediately. There's a delay um, in the stream. So I cannot see immediately what uh, your questions are, but one of my team will help with that. Uh, so hopefully by the end of it, we'll get to the questions, the Q&A and all of that. There's actually quite a lot of changes that's occurred in BizBark. Um, so BizBark 12, we have releases every year, um, updates to the BizBark. So BizBark 12 is, um, is really focused a little bit more around the integrations with data architecture. It's clarifying some terms. I'll go into the details in a minute. Uh, so you're welcome to ask questions. I'm here to help. Uh, this is really for those who are going into business architecture or those who are architects. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be training today. I'm going to be talking about changes and I'm going to be talking about the things that you need to be aware of and maybe adjust slightly um, from your perspective or from your organization. Uh, I was told off last year for not introducing myself. I never thought of it. <laughs> so for those who don't um, know me, my name is Deirdre Karen. I'm the founder and uh, of Agora Insights. We've been around for six years. Um, we have lots of clients. I've just put a few um, down there. Thanks, Mary. Um, and yeah, I've been helping people get certified and trained and whatnot for, we've got about 9,000 and we're in ni over 90 countries. So very proud of our achievement. Um, okay, LinkedIn's got a 10 to 15 second delay. Um, thanks, Hilko. Um, all right, so that's a little bit about me. You can obviously find me at our website or at our YouTube if you need more information or you have questions. But I did my job. Um, all right. So the purpose of the BizBock guide, sorry, BizBock guide, um, is really to pr provide an industry standard uh, for business architecture professionals um, and practitioners. Now, I do want to highlight that it's a body of knowledge. And so a body of knowledge is about sharing the information from the community. So it's done on a community level. And this is where the updates happen every year. Um, it is intended to guide people. It's not intended to absolutely tell you how to do business architecture. But if you are looking at being certified, you're going to be certified um, based on BizBoc, which means that whatever your exam is about, all the information is going to come from BizBoc and you're expected to know it. So what you do in your organization is completely up to you, obviously. Um, so just pointing out some obvious facts. All right, so some key changes in your BizBoc 12. And the reason why I share this is because... Um, especially for those who've gone through training and those who have been, been look, you know, uh, learning to go through the training, as well as those who are writing the exams, you need to know if anything affects you. Now, to start off with, there'll be no impact on the exam. So everything you are learning in quiz questions and that will have no impact if you write before August. Um, there will be changes. I've been told that there absolutely will be changes in the exam. Um, and there's also potentially a CBAP level two, um, CBA level two that would be coming out, but that won't affect you this year. So your key changes in terms of the content, there's been clarification on the business objects, um, the capability instance and the knowledge base. Uh, which I think is really important because those who've been in the forums will know there's been lots of questions. I've asked questions as well um, because there have been several changes over the last three years. 
And so I actually think it's been, I don't, I don't agree with everything. And I do want to highlight that, but um, we are here to have the, you know, collective understanding of what uh, these things mean. And then we'll look at the customer value composition, um, um, consumption, sorry. And the consumption is around the uh, looking at your value streams. So this is around what we do with value streams. And it's changing from just creating value to how you measure and analyze value um, from the value streams. Um, uh, so just a question quickly. So will the Agora course be tweaked? Um, yes, it will. Uh, but again, that is only likely to happen in June, July this year in line with the exam. Because uh, we, we've actually had a stand previously. So just to explain this, that unless the exam changes, we won't be changing the actual course. But there's additional content that we actually want to bring in. So we kind of work through that as we go through that. We'll be discussing TOGAF PIN. We'll be looking at data architecture and service oriented architecture. And this is more around clarifying the role of the business architect in these particular areas. Um, there are always changes to the reference models. They do not affect, affect your exam at all. So I never talk about those changes. If you're working in a particular industry like finance, for instance, it would be on you to go and check the reference models and see how they might affect what you're doing in your organization. So that's a lot of information and some of them are very minor changes. So I would recommend you go and have a look if that affects what you are doing in your organization. All right. Where did my button go? This is the thing with live, right? <laughs> okay, good. All right, so which areas have been affected? Well, there have been minor changes in capabilities. And as I said, that has been to align the language of capability instance and a business object. Um, I had to do quite a bit, bit of research on this just to make sure that some of the language is, is well um, done. So you're welcome. <laughs> um, the additions uh, are occurring in, so the addition that I discussed is occurring in the value streams. There are minor clarification changes in your information concepts as well as your organizational modeling. Um, in terms of your inner circle business architecture, policies, knowledge base has changed. A couple of words change here and there. Your products and your stakeholders have been affected in your knowledge base. So uh, those diagrams, and I'll take you through those, have been changed very slightly. Stakeholders always seem to have the biggest changes um, in BizBark. I'm not exactly sure why, but that seems to be the thing. All right. Capability instance. So a capability instance, this is the clarification. You'll also see there's a, the, this is the knowledge brief. They used to bring lots of different um, integrations into an instance. The instance right now is only about the business unit. And so the best way I can explain it, and there's all the formal definitions, you can have a quick read, uh, but the best way that I can explain it is that it's, it's specifically used by business units for particular reasons. And I'm not sure if I'm explaining this correctly. So capabilities are when a unit uses a capability, but they might not be exactly the same as how somebody else might use it. So it still has a standard and is still aligned with the business unit what they're doing in the capabilities. So it's that moment in time when a business unit, this is the clarification, is using that particular capability. And because there might be some things that are not exactly the same. Now, I'm saying that, and don't hold me to those words, please, because I'm just trying to explain the concept at this stage. So um, 
it's around the environment and the context that it's working in. So that has been clarified in your biz book. That's the uh, formal definition, which is here, uh, defined as specific realization of a capability that exists or is um, envisaged to exist in the context of a given business unit value stream. Okay, that should not be said value stream. <laughs> but um, all right, sorry, that clicked on itself. So when we look at your um, capability instance, everything is around what's happening with those business units. Sorry, this was changed. I haven't updated the text. So it's around the business unit. That was in the previous version. All right, sorry, oversight on my part. Um, all right, can we ask questions via voice? Yes. Do you have a question around that? Yes. Why, why okay. would it be important this is that? Ilko, by the way. Uh, Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> why is it important that the definition of the capability instant is so precise? I mean, when would that come into play when you discuss things like these? Yes. Um, I'm probably with you, Hilko. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I. Like I said, you know, I'm kind of the messenger in this. Um, my understanding of the preciseness, and Rob has just alluded to this in his comments, is that if you have 25 business units, they are delivering asset management differently, and that is why an instance is used. Um, so this is what BizBark is saying. Um, I had a heated conversation about this uh, two or three days ago, Um I think that there's some space to include some other things, but I understand what Bizbach is saying, which is we business units are using it and they're doing different things, exactly like you said, Rob. Um, and so there are slight modifications to how they use it. So they're using it in an instance. Yeah, um, I, I so understand the, the instance part. The, the thing is, why would... Uh, when would this definition come into play? Because you say every business unit uses the capability in their own way, which is mm -hmm. fine. But even if they wouldn't, and they would use the capability all the, uh, yeah, the same for every uh, instance, why would that matter if it is uh, their own way of working with it or a general way? <laughs> same question I asked. Is Buck Forum. <laughs> I all mean, right, the, right. yeah. So I said same question. Um, all right. So Mike White says we use an instance when we heat mapping a capability. Uh, so there, there's a live discussion on this at the moment, which is why BizBuck um, updated. But this the stance of BizBuck right now, and like I said, Hilko, I'm with you, mm. is that. It's around the business unit. And there's a lot of sense in why they've said it. So I'm not contrary to that, but I have my own perspective. So thanks, Mike. Thanks, Rob. Um, check out what's happening in the forums. On yeah, it, it's going to change next year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, all right. Uh, if you would look at the role out of all the instances, you would, so this is Mike, you would get heat mapped, um, heat map state of a capability. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. All right, next thing is business object. Um, so when I first, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. When we first discussed what a business object is, well, when we first did this, and I think this was BizBuck 10, might have been nine, um, there was no real um, reference to business object. It was around nouns and things like that. Um, and that has evolved over time. And this does align with what um, other body of knowledge is say, like if you're working in Toga framework and those kind of things. So I think it's been a really good thing. So a business object compared to a capability, a capability is an abstract concept that we use to describe the business, right? So if you're going to describe a horse, um, this is Plato's view, I think, could be Aristotle. If you're going to describe a horse, you, you have a version of a horse in your head around how things look. However, if you're going to describe 
an actual horse, <laughs> um, you know, this horse might be injured, it might not, you know, fit the ideal perspective. So when we look at business objects, we're looking at the real thing. We're looking at how this actually looks. And this is a whole bunch of components that fit into a capability. So the capability would be something that is our, our abstract concept around how we understand, let's say, stakeholders or customers or our capabilities, sorry, our capabilities, and how they link to different customers and so forth. Whereas your business object is an active thing in the business domain. So this includes at least the business name, the definition, the attributes. And as you know, in capabilities, we don't put things like our business name and our logos and those kind of things, but they link to the capabilities. Um, so it's around the behavior and what's actually occurring within the organization. And the reason why we would have a capability or an abstract concept is because there's too much information, right? So if you're looking at the objects and you're trying to focus on all of the objects, you're going to not get very far in your business architecture because it's going to be, you know, paralysis by analysis, so much data capturing. So this is the definition according to BizBock. I'm sure there's people who have multiple different views. I agree with this. I think it's a good um, explanation. Uh, and, you know, obviously we've been having a lot of forums around this as well. So BizBock 12 defines the objects. I've um, added a little bit more information. So this is not in BizBock directly, um, individual components or build, building blocks. So it'll make up a whole lot of things around your capabilities. You won't necessarily only have one business object. So unlike an information, oh, sorry, unlike other mapping where you would have a single to single or one to one relationship, you would have a one to many relationship in your business objects. Um, uh, yes. So here's another comment. So Corin Collins has said, the capability instance is also used to highlight gaps among sites. Location, you are correct. So the although it's not explicitly put in here, um, it is under the information concepts. So yes, your capability instance would also identify the way. Um, the business objects here include attributes, behaviors, relationships, constraints, um, etc. So they would have specific rules around them. So anyone who's done requirements will understand often a requirement has a rule, a business rule associated with it. Same thing with an object. There might be a rule associated um, with that. Now, um, going back to your comment, Karen, there's a lot of linkage between your business objects and your information concepts. Um, and so some of those capability instances align with that as well. One more question while I'm looking here. Which organization provides this certification? Okay. Um, it's different. It's, uh, it's the Business Architecture Guild. Uh, so we'll give you all of that information at the end. All right, so stakeholder, so your business objects and information concepts are closely related to concepts um, in the context of the business architecture. So these two relate because remember, again, information concepts are abstract. They don't necessarily go into the level of detail that you need. That's where data comes in, and we'll discuss this in a minute. So you're trying to catalog and categorize things, right? So similar to what you do in a library where you would catalog what type of information this is, where would you find the books, where would you find um, that type of information, um, you wouldn't necessarily have that 
uh, you know, in your data, which is your real information and how the relationships work. This is around cataloging and categorizing your information so that um, so that you can do that. And yes, Hilco, there is a change um, to a software change in your information concept as well. So your business object is really giving you the real example, whereas your information concept relates to the informational perspective. It's not metadata, because metadata is more around the systems and how the systems work and the information that's coming into there, but it's similar. Um, so it's more around all the information that you have in your organization, not necessarily the metadata that's coming through um, you know, that's been cataloged, but very similar. <laughs> so I'm just pointing that out. All right, next. Information mapping. There's been a slight definition just in these two components. They have something called an information concept where there's a primary definition where that means the business object could be done on its own. It could be could run on its own, whereas a secondary means it cannot run on its own. Rob, I have seen you argue this. <laughs> um, so, but this is what Bizbock is saying at the moment. So you've got an asset that is kind of like a standalone, not an asset, a business object, and then you've got a secondary object that falls underneath that. There's so it extra, hasn't really. There's one extra Sorry, clarification Rob? to that that I got from uh, Bill on a response mm -hmm. to me, which made it clear, is that a primary is is related to a uh, business objects that can exist on their own or information concept that can exist in their own. They're not dependent on any other ones, but also there are some that are primary based on the fact that if they like agreement or plan or schedule or order, which I would argue require another business object, to make yeah. the but the point being made is that if you then created order and schedule and plan underneath other um, things in your capability map, like you say customer or partner, and you had customer order manage uh, customer um, agreement management or partner agreement management, you're actually recreating the whole whole agreement decomposition underneath mm -hmm. both of those. So. It's not just the point that they are dependent, they can be dependent, uh, sorry, independent distinct things. It's also where you have something that might cause duplication across your whole yes. capability map. So some things, there are definitely things like order, schedule, plan that don't truly exist purely on their own, but they are mm -hmm. considered primary. Yes, thank you <laughs> for sharing that. Yeah, so again, this has been a language and an explanation that's been added to BizBock. It hasn't changed your diagram, your imaging that we have in it. So um, Rob did a great example of what that means, but related to your business objects and your information concepts. Next, um, value streams. So value stream, we know there's been some minor changes here as well around the business object. Remember I said to you at the beginning, there's lots around business objects that's coming in now. And so the business object in itself needs to relate to the entrance and the exit criteria. Um, so the business object changes. So in other words, if you're busy building something or you're doing that also relates to whether or not it meets the in entrance and exit criteria. So, um, yeah. So, obviously, if you have a, a business object, might be anything. I don't know. You can call anything. Um, then you you cannot move on to the next part until that's been completed as well. So it's not just let's say some tasks or some capabilities or things like that. It would have to go down into a little bit more granular level. So that's just a clarification piece. Again, not changing everything, just around uh, the content. Then there's consumption, value stream consumption. Now, 
imagine you have a new value stream, which is to add value. And as I said earlier, you've now got a value stream that needs to be measured. Um, so it's around how does each stage perform? So you've got you know, your, your normal value stream. How does each of this perform? And how close to the customer expectation has it um, got? So, yeah, so... Sorry, there's a question here. Um, Hilko, so the added exit and entry in the value stream as a whole, in addition to the individual stages, uh, I think they've always had that <laughs> in a way, but I think they've used different um, terms, so value proposition and value outcome. Uh, so it would be mm, same terms. Uh, so that when I was explaining the previous one that was on the value stream stages that's what's been changed in there that there is objects that are re related to that um all right so the value stream composition refers to the perspective of the customer or stakeholder so this is about analytics really um and again i'm not I'm trying to simplify it for everybody. If you do read in the detail, we can break that down. But it's saying it's not only about did we deliver, it's about how much did we deliver. And not only how much did we deliver in the end, but at each stage. So what? how were the expectations met by your stakeholders? Um, did the value actually perform? So for instance, you might have, um, departed, but it might have been late. Um, it, there might have been issues. Hopefully it wasn't a windy plane. Um, and so that will affect the customer experience. It'll affect the stakeholders. And therefore, there needs to be a value stream uh, consumption or measure. I just call it a measure. Um, but you should call it a consumption. So the actual diagram has changed from not only new kind of value streams and what they look like, but also the measurement of the value streams, which I think is important. This is just a word added, words added. Um, so in your organizational mapping, we've got a, a new um, section around the benefits, which is provides insight into reorganizations, mergers, um, which is great. That's part of your module 10 in our course, um, which is around the scenarios that happen within the organization. So not necessary, um, but does provide some clarity, I suppose. Same thing with the next one, which is organizational maps represent teams. Um, so yeah, this really aligns with understanding that your organizational maps um, is not only about your business units, it's not only about maybe your external, but it can also be teams. And thanks, Rob, for clarifying that piece. All right, knowledge base, it's very simple on your product mapping. Um, capability instance now works this way, it used to be the other way around. Very simple change. <laughs> no one's going to argue, I hope. Um, I do want to highlight that you'll see when I do training, I, I like, well, th with the help of Andre, uh, we design the models um, to be color-coded, to be aligned with what's in BizBoc. Um, and I don't like lines crossing. And I'm going to lead to why this is important <laughs> in, as we go through this. Um, I have a real thing about lines crossing. Some, some content I cannot even look at because of that reason. So I do make a huge effort, um, as I said, with the help of Andre. Um, but obviously, um, it gets quite difficult sometimes. So there's been quite a big change in this. Um, they've, I'm not sure why. Okay, but they have brought in this value proposition. Um, so there's been a whole redesign around the look and feel of this. Um, and so the value prop proposition, they that wasn't there before. It was just value stream and value stream stage. And so the value proposition um, really is about how, and I'm going to critique this now, but you still have to learn it. Um, 
the value proposition is, you know, at the end of the value stream where you've um, basically, you want to have that um, delivered. And so I didn't know why it's not linked to outcome. I don't understand why capability is not linked. You know, I understand how the diagrams work, but I felt that if you're going to do kind of like a model, it should align with what your outcome would be. But it does seem to focus more on the stakeholder itself. And you'll see in the meta model um, that doesn't quite align with what some of it does, but not all of it. Um, so there's it's a bit of a bone of contention from my part, but you can ignore me. <laughs> I'm just saying that's the new new version. Um, policy. So policy, what did they change in policy? Uh, oh, just the term is associated with policy. Um, so the, just the word, uh, just the words here. Um, so nothing you need to worry about um, in terms of the change log. All right, so I started with the caveat saying the meta model, <laughs> there's too many lines crossing and it's hard for me to read, which is why we have this meta model. It's not 100% aligned with, um, with what is in your BizBook when you're studying. Go and look at that meta model and make sure that you understand it. But this is more or less what we've designed to kind of simplify it and make sure no lines cross. Um, it does tell basically the same story. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to complicate anything. So do make sure that you check your BizBark just for your exam sake. Um, they're not going to ask you the meta model in terms of, they're not going to you know, ask you to draw it or recognize it or anything like that. But um, I don't want you to learn one thing and not at least go and have a look at what BizBark is saying. Um, all right, so I did a cool little thing and I asked ChatGTV, let me go back, to create a meta model for me. Obviously, it can only use ASCII language. It can't program and, you know, and do all of that stuff. It's just a text thing. I quite like their meta model, to be honest. Um, so feel free uh, that, you know, you can do that. I see a comment here, Rob. Um, when you say it's indirectly linked to outcome, yes, it is. Um, but again, the models don't align because when you're looking at stakeholder, I'm just going to explain why I'm saying this. When you look at stakeholder, that goes to an outcome, which is great, but actually the model, the meta model doesn't align with that. So it makes it difficult um, to kind of justify some of the components. And you'll see this, there's quite a few of these little models that don't directly align, um, but some of them are quite big, you know, in terms of alignment, like stakeholder, for instance, it really only has these three, um, which, you know, doesn't even, so it is implied, everything's implied, <laughs> but yeah. but. Again, if you want to try your own meta model, chat GTP can help you. Um, I was very happy with it. I did a few iterations, so it wasn't as if I just did one. Um, there were several that were done. And so it didn't get it right the first time. But this was my favorite compared to, let's say, what we have um, in this book. All right, so what's changed in TOGAF? TOGAF 10, 10 has been released. Um, so just some terms, we'll, we'll look at some terms, but you can also see a new model. And so in TOGAF, your business architecture exists in this space. Um, and obviously it then links to your data, your application and your technical architecture. And so those who have gone on training will know this. There's a model there as well on how it relates to each other. Um, you will notice that there's some terms here that were never there before. So business information is around the information concept. Um, okay, so let me just go through the diagram first. These are, again, 
lots of lines crossing, which drive me nuts. Um, but, you know, this is how, how it's been designed. You will notice some additional things like function, actor, process, control, role, and event, which according to BizBark is a little bit too much information for a business architecture meta model. Um, so there's definitely differences in approach, but the bonus is that a lot of these things didn't exist before in the meta model in TOGAF. So they've brought in value streams and business information has now been brought into the mod module 10. So they are slowly aligning um, what I would call BizBock architecture with TOGAF, um, you know, business architecture. So there's no arguments as to how, uh, you know, this is being done, but there's really a looking at refinement of the actual roles of a business architect between enterprise architecture and um, your business architecture. So Rob, that should be helpful to you to also look at some of these things. So BizBock recommends kind of removing some of these things from the model. Um, so still having the integrations as you should, but not trying to make it too much detail at this high level. Information concept um, has the relationship to data, which is good. Um, you can see it here. La. Um, so that doesn't look so beautiful, but it does have that. Lots of words, which is what I was saying here. And then missing capability to application. So remember, as business architects, we look at the capabilities and the capabilities should directly link to your application um, in some form. Um, yes, oh, that's another thing. So Rob has made a comment. I'm loving it. I have already mapped my BizBark meta model to TOGAF meta model. Uh, he has, he's shared that on the guild. Um, I think my comment was beautiful. Um, so do have a look again for those who are questioning around the differences between TOGAF and business architecture. Um, I'm very pleased to see that your TOGAF is starting to align a little bit more with BizBock because BizBock, you know, really focuses, I believe, less on kind of the integrations and the kind of operations and more on the strategy and linking the business information with um, the systems information. So in your TOGAF phase, um, so remember your TOGAF framework is around requirements <laughs> and how you get them. And it is a methodology. Uh, so it's not necessarily intended I'm saying this tongue in cheek, so don't please don't hold me to this. But it's not necessarily in these phases. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily in these phases that this will kind of um, lead to you know what's the profession of an architect. It's more around this is what you're doing. Now there's a key word here which is different, which was raised in Bizbook, which is. Um, the term create target business architecture. Now, as BIOX, according to BizBug, we don't create target architecture. It's not a, a change program. We create business architecture and we use the components of business architecture to create change um, and have different phases. So the other thing that's happened in this particular uh, module is that the language has changed to be less prescriptive um, and there has been more information provided around the roles. Uh, so that's been really good. Um, comment from William Ulrich, or oh, Bill, TOGAF model is being aligned with Guild, meta model, yes, not the other way around. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe I didn't make that clear. The BA workstream, at Open Group is run by uh, the Guild Director, Charter, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. So lots of things happening in this particular space at the moment. And the language and the clarification of the business architecture role. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, let me just go back. Has been done. So 
Turgif Mov is being aligned with Bizbuck. Okay. So that's a little bit more information. So those who are enterprise architects, <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. There's some words that have been added um, and changed. Remember, I said to you, goal and objective are viewed the opposite way in um, Togaf. So, yeah, um, that's terms. Um, Bill, maybe you can fight that out with him too. Um, so the business unit, um, the term that has been changed is organizational unit. Information concept is called business information like I showed you in the previous diagram and the course of action is also called course of action it's been added what has been taken out and I'm not sure if this was intended is that the course of uh, the strategy um, used to be there in the previous version so I'm not quite sure what that means but I did notice it and I didn't leave it in there because I didn't see it in the current state so this is basically mapping your language models together. So when you look at your TOGAF model, um, yeah, it will, at least you will understand it's the same thing. So a business information, same as information concept. All right, data management. Now, the reason why I did this in this kind of order is because a lot of what we've said previously and that's why I joined business units with business um, architecture that they actually swap objective now I think it was there before I don't know um, I just know what's happened in Bizbark. there's a reference to that um, all right so data management um, now what has happened here is Really, okay, firstly, this has changed. So this has been updated. Um, governance happens there. Um, and from our business architecture perspective, what we're trying to do is have a conversation around how we can use the information, remember, conceptual level, how we can use this information uh, to help with, with data um, architecture and data governance and so forth. And so I feel with this particular one, we do have quite a few things that um, make sense, right? So you've got information concept, you've got a lot of detail in there. And remember, you are looking at trying to influence or, or help with the data governance. So there is a link here to uh, looking at your governance um, and looking at your data security as one instance. And then we also look at your quality management. So how do we measure quality in business architecture and how does that link to your data management? And then we really are trying to, um, you know, pull the information that we have from architecture and link it. Because remember, this isn't about systems modeling necessarily. This is more around what the business does and those information concepts that we want to pull together. Um, okay, yes, I agree with you, the data. Um, so this has actually been an update from, is it Dodav? Um, sorry, I should have put the names here. Uh, so it's not that one, um, Hilco, but this is the update from that one. But yes, absolutely, it is um, a good alignment. Next, what's the time? So information mapping is part of business architecture, focusing on organizing, representing relationships among information concepts. Conceptual models, this is what I wanted to clarify because, because we say information, it's kind of like abstract. Um, I want you to understand what's the difference between a conceptual data model and what's the difference between an information mapping? So I thought I'd just clarify some of those languages because information mapping is not exactly the same. They're related, as I said earlier, but they're not exactly the same. So your conceptual data models are a type of data model. 
in data architecture, representing high-level data entities and relationships. And we do that because sometimes we have too much information, right? So when you go and look at the physical information, it can be kind of overwhelming. Whereas when you design anything conceptually, you can make decisions and you can move forward. It's the same thing when you're building a house. So you look at a model and you get this conceptual view of what the house might be. But when you have to map exactly you know, what screws you're going to have, what, you know, how many bricks and all of that, it becomes harder to make decisions. So that's why we do it at a conceptual level. So both serve different purposes within enterprise architecture. Uh, with information mapping, we emphasize the business perspective and conceptual data modeling addresses data representation in the technical implementation. So this is the official, you know, differences between the two. It's not in BizBoc. Um, directly, but I wanted to just give you an idea of what the differences are. Next, we look at service oriented architecture. So there definitely has been a lot added. So there's detailed of the common characteristics shared between capabilities and software services. There's, we, they've also broken down the role of the business architect. Uh, there's a new model, hence this one. Um, enhanced mapping guidelines. So a lot more information has been put into this aspect. Um, and discussion highlighting the role of capability behavior, information concepts, dependencies in software, um, service and design. So I advise you to go and read <laughs> the service oriented architecture. So a lot of the, the things we've discussed, I've talked about you know, there's been minor changes in text and, and things, but in your TOGAF and in this particular one, I would advise you to go and read the BizBark. Um, obviously, we will be updating this. Uh, it doesn't take a day. Uh, it's taken me quite a bit of time to kind of filter through all of the information. But, uh, you know, for a quick fix, um, go and have a look at BizBark. There's a comment here. Rob says... You can use Archimate Elements, uh, Business Object for Conceptual, Data Object for Logical, Artifact. Uh, I don't know why this is not showing me the other half. Um, are there? For what's on disk data. Thanks, Rob. So that's a good, um, good set of suggestions. And Archimate's free. So <laughs> why not, right? Uh, we can certainly use this. There are lots of tools out there, but, you know, um, use whatever you can um, get hold of. Case management and dynamic rules routing. So there have been, I wouldn't say huge changes on this, um, but you've got revised introductory text. So just looking at um, dynamic rule rules routing. I love case management. I think it's a great thing to use with architecture. There's so many components you can integrate into it. Um, and so, and actually I did have a meeting with someone around the questions around case management. So dynamic rules routing, sometimes um, it's good to understand how the case is going to be, you know, kind of run. This isn't my favorite thing. I struggle with it, so I'm going to be honest with you. But um, I, I think I've just had a mental block to it. So I need to go and have a, bit, a better look. But I did go through everything in uh, the revised uh, dynamic rules-based routing. There haven't been big changes. So from our side, our plan is to actually have a training component on this. Um, so anyone want to help me out? Welcome to, <laughs> to make an offer. Um, and then there was clarification on case management and the discipline. Um, and again, not to be confused with the random habit of opening a case. Um, a lot of systems use case management and they have a way of, of running that. I think it's a great option for business architecture to really understand. Um, yes, it's almost like that, um, Hilka. And so it's really understanding how that case is working, what rules are associated with that, how would you move that particular case um, through the process. All right, 
We're going to run out of time soon. I don't mind going over if anyone has questions, but let's get through this. Exam structure. What does this mean for you in terms of your exam? Um, you have basically got... Um, sorry. Yeah, we go. Section eight, there's been quite significant updates um, in this, which is around your TOGAF, uh, your data and obviously your service orientated design. So again, do have a, a look at that. It ha thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, and so when you have um, when you are looking at you know writing your exam, it's good to go have a look. But as I said, the exam is going to be updated. I've been told uh, fourth quarter of this year. So. You, you might have to go and look at some of the other versions just to make sure that there's alignment in the question. So that's the one area that I would say is kind of in flux at the moment. But again, we'll update that in a month or so, so you'll get an understanding. But you can use what we have at this particular time. Um, in terms of your core mapping, remember we bring in business units, um, uh, sorry, business objects a lot more. Um, there's been clarification around the um, capabilities uh, instance. So I do advise you to go and have a look at those. This is just around the wording, and I think it's it's good to know. But again, um, I do want to highlight that uh, you, yeah, you will need to be aware of when you're writing your exam. Um, this makes a difference. So those were the main highlights. Um, obviously, we're a Guild accredited, accredited Training Partner. So if you do want training, please contact us. And we now have eight minutes for Q&A if there's still more questions. I can jump in real quick. Um, you can tell that they're still searching for the perfect business architecture definition right more or less is this, is this because i'm quite new to it is this a yearly thing that they add and mm -hmm. take away some things it's becoming more perfect um i think you know there, there's so much dynamic change um i think at some point it will stabilize um and remember all of this is designed by communities um, of people who know particular areas, like, for instance, dynamic brute writing, somebody who has a skill would then write that content. Um, so there are groups um, that you can join. And so, Hilco, if you have a particular area, like let's say data, which you've been certified in, it would be good to join some of those communities um, and look at updating or stabilizing some of those options. Um, okay, I do have another question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's more more or less of a statement. I, it's not up to me, is what I'm saying. No, it's it's <laughs> just what's happening, that, right? You can yeah, you can see that there. Concepts will be stabilized. Mm -hmm. I I do think that if there's minor changes, that's not a major issue. If there's big changes, it does affect multiple things like your exam and and various other aspects. Um, which need to be taken into consideration in the future, definitely. Mm. Um, but I do advise anyone who has a particular skill to kind of work with those um, groups and really right. try to build that perfect picture, right? All right, <laughs> all right. Possible. Um, I'm happy uh, to help as well with the dynamic routing stuff. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I suppose we all have our nemesis, right? And that just happened to be mine. Mm. Um all right, Nazim asked, I've transitioned from a business analyst to a business architect, but still performing both roles. Do you think it would be beneficial? Um, I think we'll take that offline. I'll, I'll reply to you directly. I don't think it applies right now. Um, and then Rob, uh, definition of the business architecture. My typical elevator pitch is we provide a comprehensive understanding of how our company generates value by modeling the effectiveness of our essential value generation capabilities 
we lay a strong foundation for confident decision making regardless of the business scenario. Well done you. <laughs> That's a nice example. Um, Rob. Um, yeah. We got five minutes. Did you find this helpful? Are you I hope no one's worried about the exam. Um, yeah, I think that you know fairly simple things to do. Um, and it's good to keep up to date. Okay, here's another comment. Andre, I believe with I uh, agree with Hilco. I believe that the guild are continuously refining and improving. Um, and we've asked questions. Yeah, it'll lead to refinement. Okay. Yes, it will eventually be refined. So that's good. <laughs> I think there was a similar thing that happened with the um, IABA with the Babak. Uh, there was refinement. And there's other ones like your project management and those that have slower releases, let's say, and updates. Oh, well, thank you for doing the hard work for us. We're figuring out every You're detail. welcome. I like <laughs> um, I like white wine, New Zealand white wine, and red wine from um, Italy. Just if anyone's <laughs> wondering. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I, and I love the diagrams you do um, without the crossing lines. That's something that's a, a pain point of mine as well. Good work. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Appreciate that. It's it's been a pain point forever, um, and that's probably the only thing I'm really like best about but when I see it yeah um Theo is it Theo or Zoro um still confused I'm starting out with business architecture the best thing to do is go and look at the um, orientation and the introduction to that um this particular webinar is directly for those who want to understand what's changing um, so I do do other webinars um, and you will find them that will give you a little bit more insight. So I appreciate that this might be overwhelming um, for people who kind of come into this one, but we do this annually as part of the updates just to keep all people um, informed of what's going on and don't feel overwhelmed and, you know, worried about what this all means and trying to filter through uh, the information. Okay, so if that's it, we can end, but any more questions coming through? Everybody's gone. No. I'm just waiting a second in case there's something coming through from LinkedIn. All right, everybody, appreciate um, that you spent the time. Do feel free. Um, to contact me, uh, LinkedIn, via our site or our email. Um, if you do have additional questions, this is recorded. It will be um, put onto YouTube. Um, and for those who have joined the session, you will also get um, a copy via our site. So thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that update. <laughs> it took me a while. Um, but yeah, um, that's all good. I'm going to say goodbye and end the live stream.